You've got to grab that new thing, let go of that old thing and run the race. But she is leaning in, she's pressing in, she will not stop. All right, ladies, how many of you were not here last week? Let's see those hands. All right, so we welcome you into the study of the importance of a woman and her voice. I'm gonna do a recap tonight for those of you who were not here last week because we wanna catch you up. We don't want you to be uh, a ball lost in a high wind. We want you to be rooted and grounded, firmly knowing where we're going. Amen? Yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and get started because I have a lot to unpack tonight. And so the recap, uh, the first slide, please. Oh, it's up there. Great. So the recap is that we completed exercise one. So for those of you who have Eve, you have your book, Eve, The Importance of a Woman and Her Voice. We did exercise one. So those of you, you can look at that now. We learned that it was important how a woman sees herself. Because how a woman sees herself is how a woman will treat herself. And how she will allow herself to be treated. So there is an exercise before you begin to Bible study. Before you begin this Bible study, you need to do a self-evaluation. Where am I in my womanhood? Am I strong? Am I weak? Am I mature? So that exercise helps you take an individual assessment of yourself. So we did that on last week. And I want to say this, every woman needs to develop a healthy identity and become comfortable in her own authenticity. Ladies, you have your own authenticity. You don't have to try to be like me. I don't have to try to be like you. When God made you, when he made me, he made us uniquely who we are. You bring something to the table I never could bring. And I bring something that you could never bring. You have no rival, and I don't have one either. So rest in who God has made you to be. Amen? Amen. All right, so those of you who were not here last week, exercise one. Do that. Take your self-assessment. Okay, next slide, please. All right. We learned last week, why did God create woman? God created woman because it was not good for man to be alone. So God said, I have to create woman for good, to do good, to be good, to look good, to live good, to love good, because it was not good on earth without her. That is the purpose of every woman. I don't know about you, but that's good news. That's good news to know I was created for good. And the Bible tells us that God preordained good works before the foundation of the world for us to walk in. Do you know that's what Helen Keller did as a woman? She was one of the first disability advocates. Harriet Tugman, one of the first abolition rights advocates. Rosa Parks, Eleanor Roosevelt, I could go on and on and on. Women, you, me, we're created for good, to do good, to be good, to look good, to live good, to love good. You bring good to your family. You bring good to your employer. You bring good to your husband. You bring good to your family, to your friendships. That is your purpose. And you know, it looks different for different women. Amen. All right. Next slide, please. All this is recap, ladies. Um, we also learn, ladies, you remember the principles of womanhood. You can call them the rules of womanhood or you can call them the principles of womanhood. There are rules to being a woman. I don't know about you, but when I learned this, it rocked my world. You mean it's rules to being a woman? You mean if I walk in these rules, I can thrive? I don't just survive, I don't sink, but I thrive. So we learned last week that there are rules to womanhood, principles to womanhood. God does everything according to a principle based on a pattern. He created woman according to these principles. The first principle or rule of womanhood is order. Ladies, you remember we talked about order. 
What does order do for women? It provides us with clarity. It provides us with safety. It provides us with productivity. Remember when we were reading Genesis 1? Every time God brought more order, there was more productivity. When you bring more order to your life, you're going to have more productivity in your life. You're going to be able to manifest those purposes that God has set for you to complete, to fulfill. But that comes with order. I don't know about you, but chaos is a killer for me. When things are out of place and there's dysfunction and disorder, it causes me to have anxiety. I have to call things into order so I can see my way clear. So that's what order does for a woman. It brings clarity, safety, productivity, good. We just discussed what good was. We saw the theme last week in Genesis 1. It was a theme of good, right? Good. That's your purpose as a woman. Good. You're supposed, you're supposed to bring good to the situations that you find yourself in. And good doesn't always mean obeying what someone says. Sometimes good is rocking the boat. Sometimes good is disobeying. The Hebrew midwives, Pharaoh told them, look, if it's a male baby, kill him. The Hebrew midwife said, no, we're not going to kill him. We're going to do good. Because good is not killing. Good is disobeying Pharaoh. So good looks different depending on the situation and circumstance for you as a woman. Wealth, the rule of wealth. You were designed as a woman to be wealthy. Now, when I say that, the default mindset is rich money. I'm not only talking about money, but I'm talking about wealth and peace, wealth and compassion, wealth and love, wealth and revelation, wealth and understanding, wealth and competence. God wants you to be a competent woman, an articulate woman, an intelligent woman. That's why the Hebrew midwives were so powerful and they could stand Pharaoh, they could stand to Pharaoh to his face. He said, why haven't you done this? Because they were competent. They were intelligent. They were articulate. And they told Pharaoh, this is our field of expertise. When these women are on the birthing table, the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They give birth and we get there. The baby already has popped out. God wants you to be a woman that's intelligent, articulate, competent. Not, I don't know. You can't be like that. We got to know what we're talking about. Because we represent the most high. All right. Rest. Tonight. We are going to be talking about rest. If you in your books, we're in uh, week two. Rest is essential to a woman's well-being. We're going to talk about rest tonight. We talked a little bit about rest last week. What did we learn about rest? The rule of rest for a woman is that God created woman in a place of rest, from a man at rest, and from a God who commands rest. So rest is essential to a woman's well-being. And we learned that rest, what does rest give to a woman? It replenishes a woman. It restores a woman. It renews a woman. It refreshes a woman. Rest is essential to your well-being. And when I'm talking about resting, I'm not necessarily talking about putting your feet up in your bed with popcorn and watching a movie. Now, it can be that. But what I'm talking about, too, is resting in your identity, resting in your authenticity. I'm comfortable with my height. I'm comfortable with my weight. I'm comfortable with my gray hair. I'm comfortable because I pay some dues to be who I am. And I'm just comfortable being who I am at this point. I remember when I was 16 and 17, unsure of myself, unconfident. Those times have passed. And now I know who I am and I know whose I am. And I rest comfortably in who he has called me to be. Amen? Yeah. So rest is essential, women. Rest is essential to your well-being. And the last one is worth. Worth. I love worth. 
Because what does worth do for a woman? It sets a boundary in your life. It sets a standard. It tells everybody who deals with you, this is how you deal with me. I'm not going to let you deal with me on this level. You got to come up here. What God told, what God told uh, Adam and Eve, he said, for this cause, a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife. What God is saying is her worth and value is so high. I want you to leave the two most important people in your life because she deserves priority and she deserves undivided loyalty. She has no rivals. She has no rivals. And women, when you let people walk over you, talk to you any kind of way, you have lowered your worth. You've lowered the boundary. And God is saying, I set it here for you. Don't move it. Don't move it. Because if you lower your worth, you'll lower your life. So ladies, these five principles of womanhood, if you live by them, you will have a thriving life. Am I saying it's easy to live by them? No. But it's important that you understand them and you strive. You strive to have them in your life on a level that's excellent. And is, is, is it going to be some balance at times? Yes. Now, how many of you ever read Genesis 1, where the Lord says, I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. I want you to replenish. I want you to subdue it. I want you to have dominion. God didn't say I wanted you to dominate, but he said, I want you to have dominion. You cannot complete that five-fold ministry if you don't have order, good, wealth, rest, and worth in your life. You cannot be fruitful. You cannot multiply. You cannot replenish. You cannot subdue, and you cannot have dominion. So this is essential. All right, next slide, please. So tonight, I want you to turn to page 14, and I want you to do exercise two. We're gonna journey deeper into womanhood. Last week, we did a self-assessment of ourselves. Now I want you to do a self-assessment of how we see other women. How do you see other women? Because how you see other women is going to be how you treat other women. So ladies, when you finish with exercise two on page 14, I want you to say amen. Some of you finished fast. Some of you did it for homework, huh? I like that. I like that. I love that proactiveness. While some of you are finishing up, I want to talk a little bit about this because how we um, see other women is how we will treat other women. We're going to look at this in the Bible. If you know the story of Sarai and Hagar before Sarai's name became Sarah, I believe that Sarah treated Hagar unrighteously because she did not see her righteously. And if we're going to be women, I've got to see the Omago Day in you. The Omago Day is just the image of God in you. I have to see your humanity. I have to see human dignity in you. And if I don't see God's image stamped on you. If I don't recognize that, I can't treat you properly. That's where it starts with. 
It starts with that. I have to see God in you because you're made in his image and his likeness. So I can't just treat you. I love that scripture. The Lord said, how can you say you love me whom you have not seen, but yet you hate your brother who you see every day? I love that scripture because it makes you walk circumspect, doesn't it? It makes you straighten up and fly right. Because I can't profess to love God and I hate my brother. Because the love of God is really not in me. And that's Bible. That's Bible. All right. So ladies, you finished exercise two? How you see other women? And ladies, just be real, because it's just you in the book. Just be real, you know, put what's, what's real. Because I want us to grow. I want us to grow. Because when we tell the truth, we can take a healthy self-assessment, and then we can grow and develop into who God is calling us to be. Amen? Amen. All right, how many of you have your uh, Bibles? Okay, go to Genesis chapter 3 with me. We're going to dig deeper into Eve's sin. It's so important that you see what happened to Eve. When you have Genesis 3, chapter um, 1, just say amen. So I'll, okay, I'm just going to read it in your hearing. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Look what he's asking her. Yea, hath God said? What he said, he's questioning her ability. Did you really hear God correctly? Did he say what you really thought he said? And I don't know about you, when people ask me questions like that, I'm like, wait a minute, maybe I didn't hear it right. <laughs> you know, we like to talk about Eve, but the road less traveled is hard to walk. She was the first woman. She didn't have a mentor. She didn't have a role model. She is walking this road as the first woman. And notice, Satan did not come on the scene until she came on the scene. That tells you that it's some power that she carries. I don't think she knows the power she carries, but he definitely does. So we ask her, hath God said you shall not eat of, the, of every tree of the garden? <clears throat> and look how he phrases the question. The question really is a lie because he says, shall not eat of every tree. Now, God didn't say every tree. He just said that one tree of good and evil. But look at say every tree. And you know, that's what a, you know, a liar will do. They will stretch the truth. And that's what he does. And this is Eve, her na naivety. Look at two. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Yeah, we can eat of the fruit. But it's the tree that's in the middle of the garden. God has said you shall not eat of it. Neither shall you touch it lest she die. She couldn't pick up that he was running game. He knew God didn't say every tree. He knew he said that one tree, but he wanted to engage her into conversation because once you start talking with the enemy, sometimes you talk too much and then you stay too long and the next thing you know it goes all wrong. <laughs> Look at four. It says, and the serpent said unto the woman, he shall not surely die. Now he's already put doubt in her head, but look what, did I hear it right? Oh, I cannot tell you women. How many of you have ever been in a room? Did, 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 did I hear it right? Should I, should I ask the question? I'm going to look stupid. Am I, am I intelligent enough? Am I smart enough? Am I pretty enough? The doubt that sets in our minds. This is what he's working with her. He's working on her. And the more you talk to people, the more the doubt sets up because he's not affirming her. He's actually causing her to question herself. Now, the reason God did not want her to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when you eat something, you become intimate with it. God only wanted her to be intimate with good. When she ate that fruit, she became intimate with evil. He only wanted you and I to know good, never to know evil. And when she became intimate with evil, she did not have the capacity to handle all of that evil because she wasn't God. 
but yet it was unleashed on her. Okay, look at six. It says that when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and she did eat and gave it also to her husband with her and he did eat. He knew if he got to her, he could get to him. That's the power she carried. She carried the power of persuasion. She carried the power to literally persuade. She had purpose. And her purpose was to bring good, but here she is bringing bad. She's violating that purpose. Look at seven. Well, no, let's get down. Because I really got to get you to the curse. This is what I want you to uh, see. Look at 16. It says, I will put enmity between. This is God. God is basically saying what has happened, what has been done. And God begins to... Uh, render the consequences to Eve. And I don't like to think of this as God putting a curse on them because it's not really God putting a curse on them. It is, they violated a principle in the earth and the principle is bringing the consequence to Eve. The principle, it's like a fire is hot and I put my hand in fire. God is not cursing me because my hand is burned. It's the principle of the fire being hot that's burning me. So God is not cursing her. It's the principle she violated. She's got to face the consequences, right? And it says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. God said it's going to be hostility between Satan and a woman. I don't believe it's just Eve. I, I believe it's every woman. Satan is coming to attack your order. He's coming to attack your rest, your wealth, your worth. What's the other one? What am I missing? The principles order. He's coming to attack all those principles that keep you thriving. He said, I'm going to put hostility between you and the woman. He said, it's going to be hostility. He's coming for you. Woman, he's coming for you. He's coming for you. But when you know he's coming for you, you gird up. You armor up, you armor on. Right? Because we know how he's coming and we know how he's going to come. He's coming to attack my order. He's coming to attack my rest. He's coming to attack my wealth. He's coming to attack everything that's going to have me thriving. Yes. He said, I'm going to put hostility between you and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, this is a messianic scripture. This is talking about uh, the birth of Jesus Christ. Um, and basically, the Lord said, Jesus is going to give Satan a head wound, but Satan is going to give Jesus a heel wound. But I still stick by what I said, there is hostility with every woman that comes after Eve. He's still after you, like he was after her. Uh, 16, and it says, and unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Ooh. <laughs> He's getting women in motherhood. Look at this. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. When I saw this, I used to think when I was younger, I said, this is about labor pains. And it is, you know, you're going to have baby, a baby that's going to be painful. If you've ever felt labor pains, I have. I have three kids. You know, my mom told me, she said, you're going to think it can't get any worse and the next pain is going to be harder. And that's exactly how it were, was. It was, you know, I was telling my husband, get to the hospital. You know, uh, those contractions. But it's not t only talking about sorrow and conception. When you bring them up, and I got a 19-year-old, I have a 17-year-old, I have a 16-year-old, I'm bringing them up. It's some sorrow. <laughs> it's some sorrow. It's some joy and gladness, but it's some sorrow with that. So it's sorrow. And then he says, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now he gets us in our marriages, our motherhood and our marriages. Arguably the two most important places in a woman's life. You got to fight. But it's right there. And every woman that comes after Eve, you can study it. And we're going to study a little bit tonight. Um, every woman. It's going to be marriage and motherhood. Marriage and motherhood. Marriage and motherhood. It's a fight to the finish. It is a fight to the finish. It's not for the faint of heart. It's for the ready and it's for the steady. 
You know, some of the women, oh, I just want a baby. I just want, I'm like, are you sure? Are you sure? Do you want to stay on your knees praying and fasting and interceding? I'm like, are you an intercessor? I'm like, are you an intercessor? You know? Because that's what it is. It's a lot of praying, a lot of fasting, a lot of sacrificing. That's what it is. All right. So ladies, I want you to see that. That's where that, um, we see Eve, she steps out of uh, order, doesn't she? She steps out of God's order. She steps out of God's rest. She steps out of her worth. She uh, steps out of her wealth. And ultimately, they get evicted from Eden. I'm going to give you this as a bonus. Because this set up an Eve, and she turns around, and she has uh, Cain, and she has Abel. Cain, seen as operating in his life, and he gets evicted from the east of Eden, and he has to go to the land of Nod. So you see mother and dad get evicted, then you see son gets evicted. So you see these proclivities in families. This marriage and this motherhood, you're going to see this in Sarah. You're going to see this in Hagar. These, these are things that women struggle with. This is their sisterhood and womanhood. Just because you and I are women, there's some things that we just share. Regardless of nationality, ethnicity, we just share. Because we were made and created according to God's pattern. You guys have seen those dress patterns, haven't you? you like you can get a pattern. My grandmother was a sewer. Uh, my mother-in-law, she sews. And you can get a, you ever see those dress patterns you get? And you're like, that pattern can make this dress, this dress, and this dress? Well, that's how we are as women. It's a pattern. We all look different. But it's all the same pattern we've been made by. All right. Now, ladies, we're talking about the importance of a woman. You know the importance of a woman is to bring good, right? To do good, to look good, to live good, to love good. But her voice, Satan was trying to usurp her voice. When you think about voice, we generally think about what someone says, don't we? Voice is more than what you say. Your voice is what you do, and it's what you believe, and it's what you say. So get this, he's trying to usurp her voice because if he can get her to take his voice in place of her voice, he wins the power, he wins the persuasion. So it's more than what you say, it's what you do and it's what you believe. Eve said the right thing to Satan, didn't she? Look at what she said. We shall not eat of every tree. It's the tree in the midst. She said the right thing. I believe she believed the right thing. But she did not do the right thing. So her voice, she loses her voice to Satan. This is the importance of a woman in her voice. That's how come Satan doesn't care if you say all of this stuff. Oh, I love the Lord. Oh, praise God. Worship. Your lips are close to God, but your heart is far from him. Satan doesn't care about that. He said, say all of that stuff. I want you to say it. But when what you say, what you do, and what you believe is not in complete unity, you have compromised your voice, the power of it, the persuasion of it, the purpose of it. It does not carry the weight that it was designed to carry. Do you see that, ladies? So your voice is more than what you say. And your voice is really powerful. And we hear this, we heard this as little children. Practice what you preach. Practice what you teach. Otherwise, it becomes hypocrisy. Doesn't it? They say an ounce of example is worth more than a gallon of advice. Live it in front of me. I want to see you live it in front of me. All right, ladies. I am pushing, pushing tired. I'm, I'm just going to push this. Genesis 12, go with me, and I promise I'm going to give you some time. I want you to see the impact. Go to the next slide for me. I want you to see the impact of, go to the next slide, the next slide for me. Okay, the next slide for me. 
The next slide. The next slide. Okay, I want you to see how Eve's sin reverberates all the way to Sarah. It's going to reverberate all that way to Hagar. It's, it's reverberating to you and I today too. But I want you to see the impact. And we're going to read a little bit about this in this uh, Genesis chapter 12. You got it, ladies? Yes. Look at verse 10. I'm going to read it in your hearing. It says, And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. In other words, Abraham is saying, I need you to lay down your life for me because you are so beautiful. Now we know a husband is supposed to lay down his life for his wife. But what I want you to see is that look how, how Sarai is being treated by the father of faith. What God is showing us in this scripture is that Abram has asked his wife, Look, say you're my sister, because I don't want them to kill me. He said, you're so beautiful. You're so fine. He said, I can't protect you. I'll lose my life because they, they want you. Out of order. Out of order. You see, her worth has been reduced to beauty. It's, re it's been reduced to bodily. I want you to see these principles you see how they're not at work. The principles of womanhood are not at work. I want you to see this. Because God designed for a woman to take priority, to have undivided loyalty. Abraham said, my loyalty is to my life, and I need you to do what I'm asking you to do so I can live. Okay? And look at 14, and it came to pass that when Abram was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman, and she was very fair, very beautiful. The princess also of Pharaoh saw her and commanded her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And he entreated Abram well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. In other words, she was so fine. Pharaoh said, look, I'm going to give you this, this, and that, and that, and that. This is how they believed they got Hagar. She was a part of the maid servants that they gave. That's how she had been reduced to beauty. A woman is more than beauty is, what is what? Beauty is deceitful. Is that it? Or is it fleeting? What's Proverbs 31? Beauty is fleeting and flattery is deceitful. Yeah. So it's fleeting because ladies, it's all going to come down. We all going to have those personal summers. It's all, you know. But we are being conformed into the image of God's darling son, Jesus Christ. So we're going to get better and better and better. The inner man is going to grow. Amen? And that's what it's about. And look at 17. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. God said, look, I got to step in here because Abraham, just get out of the way. You're not Abraham yet. You're still Abram. You newly saved. I got any new, newly saved Christians in here? When you're newly saved, it's hard to discern some things. Sometimes you need a spiritual, mature Christian to walk alongside you because they recognize what you don't recognize. Sometimes you need a Naomi when you're a Ruth. Come on, Baby girl, mm -hmm. that's a good man. Let me tell you what to do, how you can secure him. Because you don't see what she sees. God had to push Abram, get on out of the way. I got to take care of my daughter, my baby girl, like she's supposed to be taken care of. Because you're playing games. You will have her sexual integrity compromised. But I've got to intervene. And God is teaching not only Abram, but he's teaching Sarah. Baby girl, I'm the star of your story. Don't look to your husband, don't look to your man. I'm your king of kings. I am your Lord of lords and I am your God of gods. I want you to see this. And Abraham didn't do this one time, but he does it twice. Twice. Look at here. It says, and Pharaoh called, 18, and Pharaoh called Abram and said, 
What is this thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy sister? Pharaoh said, you almost got me killed. Man, what is wrong with you? You almost got me killed. This is your wife? He said, look, I may be a pagan. I may not worship God, but I know I'm not supposed to go with another man's wife. And look at 20. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. So God, what is God doing? He is coming in, and he is bringing order in Sarah's life. That's why he's bringing rest. You think she could rest any day he was... Pharaoh was going to be trying to get with her. That was the whole point. God was restoring worth. God was restoring what wealth. I don't even have to tell you about wealth. You saw everything he got. But that was God. It wasn't Abram. So ladies, I'm going to give you some time and I want you some chat to chat amongst yourself. I, I laid a lot on you and I still have so much more to give you. But I want you to uh, turn in your Bible studies and I want you to, I think it's page, let me see. Right, ladies, I think I want you to look at question. I think it's nine. Have you ever found yourself more concerned about what man thinks than what God thinks? And then I want you to look at that's on page uh, 25. And then also look on page 23, three, because the first woman was created in a place of rest and from a man at rest. Do you think rest should be integrated in your life on a daily, monthly and yearly basis? If so, how should it be integrated. So page 23, question three, and then page 25, question nine. All right, ladies, we're going to bring it back in. I know you're enjoying yourselves at your tables. One thing that I hope comes from this, I hope, I hope you ladies make friends. Yeah. It is so important to be in community with women who love you and love the Lord. And I'm hoping that during this time of fellowship that you find your tribe, you find your people. And that is my prayer. Um, next week, I'm going to give you homework. So we're going to be in week three. So I'm going to ask you to read all of week three for next week. Okay? So that way... We can kind of hit the ground running. I won't do a lot of recapping. I won't do a lot of, because you will have read, and I can just uh, go in. Now, I want to hear a little bit from you tonight. Did uh, the discussions at your table, did anyone get an epiphany? Did anyone get a revelation that they care to share with the entire group that just was a blessing? Kind of. You care to share? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Okay. We discussed over here was a Bible study, like this being one of our rest kind of um, activities. Yeah. That is so that is so true. If you could not hear, she said the Bible study is a rest activity. Yes. It really is. It, it really is a rest activity. I find myself resting when I'm studying in the word of God. Uh, and it's a worship too, right? It's worship because how much is God worth to you? How much time are you willing to set aside and give him? And I tell you, when you give him time, all he does is pour it right back into you. I come out filled up. I come out sealed and healed when I've spent time with him. And that's such a beautiful point. Rest really is in the presence of God. Hi ladies, I actually had a question for my table and it was more of a self-reflection is, I don't think I'm in order, so how can I rest? The biggest question tonight was how do we find time to rest? Those of us 
that have children, responsibilities, work, partners, and husbands who are very unique. <laughs> How do you find time to rest? And so some of us said that we start removing things out of our schedule. Some of us have, like you said, um, have this time for rest, or you know, wake up a little bit earlier in the time to, to be with God. Um, I have someone I know that does Pilates in the middle of her day just to get that time to rest and reflect. So it's just answering the how we get time to rest, but it first starts with order. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. I have a very loud voice. Can everybody hear me? Yes. I used to be a camp counselor. So. <laughs> anyway, so I am a mom of five. And after last week, I have been sleeping, okay? Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. And I, just, you know, I have a child who's on the spectrum. He has autism. And, you know, I got teenagers. And I said, listen. From here on out, we shutting the whole house down at 10 o'clock. <laughs> and that was me using my voice because let me tell you, it's like, oh, but I got, no, no, no. I, it's gone way to small cell phones, you know, and I do, I am in a relationship. I'm like, listen, can I conversation after this time because I knew that I was starting, I feel like I was losing my mind a little bit, you know, and I was like, oh gosh, I have to rest. And then last week, there also was a study that I found that I'd seen, I came across, and it said that women need 10 hours of sleep for like good mental health, right? And I was like, that's, that's not possible, you know. Yeah. However, but I know that I can aim for like seven hours. So I just started putting on my phone, I have an iPhone, and it says, okay, it's time to start winding down at this time. Good job. You know, so. I'm in bed, the whole house is shut down by like 10.30 mm -hmm. at my house, you know, and I'm like, that's it. And so you're going to have to kind of like, for me, it was sleep, because mm -hmm. I get up early, no matter what, yeah. no matter how early, how late I go to bed, I'm still up, and so I was like, not able to focus and mm -hmm. stuff, because I'm sleeping on, running on like four hours of sleep, and so for me, I'm like, okay, I need to go to bed by 10, or be in the bed by 10, like start, whatever my routine is, and right. you do, everybody, we got to kind of be laying it down by that time so that was just the first step for me and that's kind of how I did I had to let everybody know like hey amen okay, if you need me mom's gonna be resting amen. So, <laughs> they're in the bed so amen. I'm I'm that's it I have 13 and 14 year olds so don't don't I'm I'm no good to you no more after this hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, amen. I mean, since I'm using your voice that, that was hard for me because I'll be up and we're doing home no you're gonna have to do your homework in the morning you're gonna get up you know, I don't know. This is it. Everything needs to be done. Yeah. So we have, and that was me also trying to get order too. So it's like, we have responsibilities. So if your homework needs to be done, whatever needs to be done, you know, and then we kind of, sh sh you know, shift the days because they do come on Wednesdays or whatever. But, you know, you go take it day by day. And I'm like, my seven hours is not ten. Mm -hmm. but it's, it's, more than, it's more than four. <laughs> Jewel, that is beautiful. That is beautiful. Give her a hand. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? All right, I thought I saw a hand. I was just going to kick you back on what you said, and that's what I wrote in my book was that rest starts with order. And that's basically what you said, and that's when your voice can be heard when you put everything in order. And so um, I've been on this thing of uh, purging. And the part of that purging is uh, I've just been putting it on a calendar, mm -hmm. you know, because it becomes overwhelming when you try to do it all and then you just don't do nothing. So I've just been really just trying to take, you know, two days a week, get rid of something, you're, and it's it's bringing order. It's like my mental is not all over the place. And mm -hmm. um, for example, of the four hours, I used to think that was cool. Like I could just thrive on like, you know, four or five hours. And I was like, yeah. So today showed up. Amen. With my three hours of sleep, and my mm -hmm. boss said something to me at like four or five, and I was like, yeah, I'm just fried. Mm -hmm. And then you came and you said that, I was like, oh, yeah. I need that rest. Yes, and uh, I think it was Pastor Susie during her summer, sermon on Sunday, you know, she repeated, God said, come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. And he gives his beloved, what does he give us? Sleep. I don't know about you, but I need peaceful sleep. I need sweet sleep. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I'm going to 
Okay, so at our table, we kind of look, looked at rest um, a little differently. Um, but we looked away from the actual physical rest, um, and we thought about uh, redirection of our minds, um, focusing on other things, um, other activities, um, such as like jigsaw puzzles, um, word search puzzles, um, praying, um, you know, the relaxing in the bathtub, um, things like that. Um, sometimes our minds are going like 100 miles per hour. We've got so many things that we have to think about. Mm -hmm. So sometimes just um, taking your mind off of everything in the world and just maybe focusing on something that we like to do, um, you know, um, it, it will kind of help your mind rest, which also allows your body to get some rest as well. Amen. You know, my mom would tell me, she said, it's one thing uh, I would finish studying or for test. And she said, you know, you're resting your body. She said, but you haven't rested your mind. Right. And I'm, I'm so glad you brought that aspect. Ladies, I'm going to pray over you and I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Susie to make any last minute announcements. But it's been a blessing with you tonight. Amen. 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 Let's posture our hearts to rest before our God. <laughs> Father God, in the name of Jesus, thank you so much, Lord, just for your word. For truly, it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. Thank you for reminding us of age, old, ancient truths, God, that come from you. These are principles, principles, God, that we need to implement and integrate into our lives. Teach us as women how to rest moment by moment, minute by minute. God, day by day, so we can be women, oh God, of clarity, women of confidence, women of competency, God, because we know how to rest. And it looks different for different women because we're at different ages, different stages. So help us not to compare ourselves by ourselves, but God, give us the rest that's cut to the contours of our life so we can be who you're calling us to be and we can show up as our best selves, God. Lord, we just thank you, oh God, just for your, your word on tonight. We thank you, Lord, that it's rich and it is liberating. We thank you that it is enlightening and it's enduring. We ask God that allow the word that went forth tonight to fall upon good ground in our hearts and our minds. God, let it take good root and let it bring forth good fruit that will abide and remain. Help us to walk this out, God. So we will journey deeper into womanhood and we will walk in divine order, divine worth, divine wealth, divine rest. Oh, God, and divine good. Seal us with your spirit. Fill us with your spirit. Heal us, God, by your spirit and have your way completely and totally in every area in our lives. Those areas, oh, God, where there are cracks and crevices that need to be cleaned out. Come on in, God and clean them out and have your way. We are naked before you, Lord, asking you to clean us, to fill us, to heal us, to seal us, oh God, so we will be the women, the women, oh God, that are warring in these last days for our families, for our children, for our nation, oh God, and for our community. Lord, and bless us on tonight as we depart from each other, but not your presence. Go with us, shield and protect us, cover us and keep us. Bless us, oh God. Send your angels to encamp round about us. Allow no hurt, harm, or danger to come near to us and give us a peaceful sleep, Lord, in a sweet, sweet, sweet rest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.